to uh, the Heritage Poultry Breeding live stream. Uh, I'm going to be your host, Mike Badger. Let's put on here so we can see <laughs> myself and Lisa. Um, and for those of you who are going to watch the replay, this will be a uh, presentation on egg color and creating sex links in heritage poultry. Um, and kind of Lisa will guide us through some of those um, things that we need to know to, to make to make those things happen uh, from our standard bred breeds. And um, as we get people into our queue here, I'll just set it up. Remember our live stream, the live portion of this is presentation first half, Q&A second half. So we'll take questions after Lisa goes through her presentation. And then in the replay, when you're watching the replay, you're just going to see the, the presentation portion of it. And uh, the, the Q&A session will be will be lopped off. But I'm, I'm pretty happy tonight to be joined by Lisa. She she responded to a call I made, uh, I guess, last month about mm -hmm. topics. And she presented this topic. Um, and I thought it was a, I thought it was a good one. I thought it was relevant. And uh, so, so she agreed to come on and do this. So we got Lisa Van Horn, and she's one of the founding members of the Peninsula uh, Poultry Breeders Group, which is a collaborative group of small heritage poultry growers in Washington State uh, on the Olympic Peninsula, hence the name. And so she's currently breeding barred Plymouth Rocks, Welsomers, and Cream Leg Bars, and uh, along with a number of heritage hybrids, as she calls them. And we'll probably get into that as we go through the the uh, session tonight. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Um, and uh, if you're ready to start, I'm ready yeah. to put your presentation up. And we I think if we, and if we just go right to the presentation, that'd be great. Give some folks something to look at besides us and um, we can get started. And All right. So let me bring it up for you here. Okay. And one of the things that we, I, I will just clue people in, Mike, that one of the things we discovered as we were checking is that um, I'm not able to advance the slides, so Mike has to do it for me. Um, so he'll, he'll be, um, I'll be having to tell him when we're ready to move forward, like we're ready to go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to just give you a little bit of background first about myself and our group. Um, we are a group of small poultry breeders. We have our own farms, but we collaborate as a group um, to do chick uh, sales and hatching egg sales. And um, we are located in the very northwest corner of Washington State. We're on the Olympic Peninsula, which is quite a, a rural area. Um, however, we are also on the western side of Puget Sound. So we do um, kind of are very close to a, a large urban center, which is Seattle and its surrounding urban and suburban areas. Um, we collaborate together to market um, our birds, to do pre-orders. We have a website. Um, we do social media, newsletters, kind of educational newsletters. Um, we incubate together and hatch together. So as we each only have a couple of breeds, maybe two or three breeds, um, we are also able to then pool our resources, pool our chicks and eggs together and do larger numbers um, of hatching and multiple breeds um, for our sales. And then we also do customer service together as well. So it's not a formal um, model, but it is um, a collaborative one between friends and we find it works really well, particularly for really strapped uh, time uh, farmers and um, I will say under my breath for older farmers, because we're all of us a little bit older in our group. Um, so the next slide. Our main primary customers are small farms and backyard and homestead flocks. Like I said, we're close to the Seattle urban suburban markets, and we're really fortunate that we live in an area that's very supportive of small local food sources, both meat, eggs, vegetables, we have a ton of farmers markets. Um, we get very good prices for our, our for product. Um, although of course, lip cost of living is also higher here as well. Um, we do find that some of our farmers are um, 
they're humane certified, so they need to source their birds from uh, a humane source. Most of our small flocks probably um, run between 100 to 500 birds in a pasture egg environment. And we also know a lot of folks will do both our birds and then also kind of do a hybrid model where they bring in uh, maybe some hybrid layers from a hatchery or also maybe run broilers as well as running some heritage birds. So um, there's a lot of different um, diversification that people are doing in our area and exploring different markets. Um, next. What we have found is that um, some of the demand in our area is pretty high for things like uh, egg colors, lots of different colors of eggs. There are some folks who kind of go nuts about the egg colors. Um, and we find that we're able to provide eggs on a spectrum of colors with crossbreeding of our standard bred birds. And we've also started um, to provide sex linked, what we're calling heritage hybrids, where we're using our standard bred birds as the base um, for a sex linked dual purpose bird. And we have a focus on all of our birds for, you know, weight gain, early maturation of our cockerels, as well as a high rate of lay for our pullets. Um, but by exploring sort of this niche of, of hybrids, we're looking at other options for um, kind of marketing of heritage meat and pastured egg producers. Um, What's nice about having a sex link, since we're not hatcheries, we can't vent sex our birds. We normally would have to sell them straight run. Um, but with the sex links, we can put the males and females into separate streams right away. We can put a higher price point on the females because we know they're pullets and people want pullets. We can sell those to both a small farm and also a backyard or homestead environment. And then we can lower the price point on the male chicks um, and we're doing that primarily to encourage the use and exploration of a heritage meat market. It's, it's interesting because in our area, there's a lot of interest in heritage pork, um, beef, lamb, but particularly pork. Um, and, but I was just um, contacted about a month ago by a heritage meat cooperative of different chefs who are doing heritage meats and they wanted to source, um, have a contract and source birds from us. Well, we don't grow birds. So there is some interest out there and I'd love to see other farmers getting into exploring that. What I was hoping to share with you tonight was an understanding of how some of these factors can be used with your existing birds um, and give you some additional opportunities to explore a way of providing sustainably bred birds for both a small scale commercial and backyard markets. Maybe you've got a breed already that if you were interested in getting another breed, you might consider getting one that you can use as a sex link. Um, it's not that you're going to stop breeding your purebred birds, um, or not purebred, but your standard bred birds or your pure birds, but um, it does give you another option and um, you can take advantage not only of what it provides, but also I think of the kind of what we call hybrid vigor or heterosis that a crossbreed does give you as well. Next. So we have to talk a little bit about genetics and I promise this is the only, you know, kind of science slide I'm going to, I'm going to force on you. Um, if you remember back to high school biology, um, within the cells, that's a cell there on the left, that little blue circle, um, are chromosomes. And the chromosomes are in pairs. Um, one of the pair comes from your mother, the other one comes from your father. And each chromosome exists as a spiral of DNA, of a DNA molecule. So if you looked at those two little chromosomes, you would see that they kind of make this what's called a double helix or a, um, a spiral. And that contains the genes. If you go in even closer, you'll see um, that on those spirals are the genes, which are those things that code for the different traits um, that an individual has. So whether you have blue eyes or curly hair or lay blue eggs or have black feathers or um, you know, all sorts of different traits that can be um, found to be controlled by those, by those genes. Um, if you look um, up at that little, up above it is the actual genome of the, of the chicken. Chickens have 38 pairs of chromosomes. That's a total of 76. You compare it to a human being, they have 23 pairs. So chickens have a lot more than us. Um, doesn't mean that they're necessarily more sophisticated than we are, but it does mean that they have more genetic material, possibly because they're older um, evolutionarily. They've been around for a long time. And you can notice some of those genes are pretty, or some of those chromosomes are pretty tiny 
they might be a little bit of kind of genetic junk in there. Um, but whether you are a bird or a mammal, a human or a chicken, you have two sex chromosomes. Um, in humans, it's called an X and a Y chromosome. In birds, it's exact opposite. It's a Z and a W. And how it works is that, um, you know, the this is the the genome that you see here is um, for a male bird. He has a Z and a W. And then the, or I'm sorry, this is for a female bird. Um, even I get mixed up sometimes because it's the exact opposite of mammals. And it is these genes um, that the sex genes, the Z and the W, are the ones that we will be using when um, they have the genes that will be used for the sex link crosses. You're not going to need to know a lot of the details. I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, before we talk about how to actually go about producing those sex links. To get us warmed up a little bit, first we're going to talk about egg color um, because that is not a sex link gene. So we'll go to the next slide. And egg color is controlled by um, a gene that's called an autosomal gene or a non-sex link gene. So it's not on a sex chromosome. It's not inherited in any way that has to do with the sex of the bird. Um, and eggshells basically come in two colors. They come in white and they come in blue. And white is the wild type. Um, and that's what the majority of chicken eggs are white eggs. Blue is dominant over white, but it's not the most common egg color. And the reason for that is probably due to the fact that it only evolved about 500 years ago in South America, probably caused by a retrovirus. And so maybe in a couple thousand years, if we came back, we would find that there are more blue birds or blue eggs being laid. But at this point in time, there are fewer blue eggs than white egg layers out there in the world. Um, but the blue is dominant over the white, and we'll see how we use that in a, in a breeding situation. How to actually tell the color of an egg um, the egg shell itself is to look at the inside of the egg. Like I've got these eggs all kind of cleaned out. And if you peel away those little membranes inside the eggs, you'll look and see if it's actually blue or if it's white. And the reason you can't always necessarily tell from the outside is if we go to the next slide, that the brown eggs are actually a white egg with brown pigment put over the shell. And this pigment's called protoporphyrin. It's put on in the shell gland. So it's after the shell is formed, before it's actually laid. And you've probably picked up an, a brown egg out of a nest box that may have just been laid. And you can almost like wipe off some of the brown sometimes or scratch it. Um, and that's because it's kind of like painted on afterwards over a white shell. Protoporphyrin is actually um, uh, made from heme molecules. So when the bird is done with some of its blood, maybe the blood's ready to be recycled, it'll break it down. And it is those heme molecules from the blood um, that go into the shell gland and create that brown um, color. That's just kind of a little, little side fact. Um, there are over a dozen genes that are believed to influence the brown color. It's not very well understood. There have not been a lot of um, research into it. And so it does leave it a bit of a um, hit and miss when it comes to, to breeding for different brown colors. It's still as much art as science, I think. Um, but um, that sort of, you know, is where we are with brown is that there's a lot of different colors of brown, but it's all with the pigment being laid over the eggshell. Um, next slide. Blue eggshells, on the other hand, are created by an addition to the shell itself of something called biliverdin, which is a green bile pigment. That's put in there while the shell is being formed. So it's not a coating that goes on afterwards. It is the actual color of the shell. Um, any of the genes that for brown color that the bird may inherit will then be painted on as brown over the blue. And that's what gives you the range of green, which we can see on the next slide. And it is these green eggs that you can just get all sorts of amazing colors of green. Some of them take a lot of work to get to some, like the bottom middle colors. Those are done by a breeder down in Florida. And she's bred many, many generations of these birds to get these amazing kind of avocado green eggs. Um, and the one on the bottom right with the speckles um, is another breeder that's kind of a master breeder for getting colors. But even a simple cross can give you the rest of those greens. Those are all from our birds, and they're all from a simple cross that we'll show you um, where you're breeding just a blue egg layer and a brown egg layer to get a nice variety of different greens. And next. 
So I don't want you to be worried about this slide. And I was telling Mike, one of the things I'm going to do afterwards, probably in the next few days is on the forum, I'll put a forum post up and I'll put some of these kind of visuals in there so you can look at them at your leisure if you're interested. But basically what I wanted to show you here is the basics of um, breeding for egg color. So if I take a blue, if you look at the top left hand there, if I take a blue egg layer and I cross it to a light brown or tinted egg layer, then I will get a, light, a bird that lays a light green egg. So it's a blue shell and it's putting a little bit of light brown over it and it gets me a light green. The term for that in genetic terms is a, an F1 generation. That's not important for you to remember, but you will hear that conversation go on within egg breeding communities. So just in case, a little heads up, that's what that means. And another version might be there on the top right where we take a blue um, egg layer and we cross it to a dark brown egg layer. Um, and we get what's called an olive egger in the trade um, or an olive, cause it's a darker, more brown pigment, a darker color. Um, we can then take that olive egger and breed it back and do what's called a back cross to a dark brown, like possibly to its parent or another one of the breed it originally was in its original cross. And you can get an even darker egg. And this is where you start to get some of those amazingly dark um, all of eggs that you can see on the internet or on some of the poultry sites. The challenge here is that when you do that back cross, you don't get all green, you get 50% brown. So it takes a lot of space, a lot of patience um, to work on some of these darker egg colors. One cross that is an easy one to make and is more predictable is the third line down where we take an olive egger and we cross it back to a blue egg laying bird. And we can get some really interesting and lovely shades of blue or blue green that are kind of like teal. And in the trade, you'll notice these being sold as teal eggers or azure eggers is one very popular one that's out there. Um, and we know that we are gonna get this something in the blue green because the again, the blue parent has a dominant gene. So we know that there's gonna be blue in that mix. Um, and um, that's probably the, easiest combination after the initial combinations there in the top row. Um, I would suggest that people, particularly for the first time, stay with that combination up on the top where you're breeding a blue egg liar with a brown to get a green. Um, you can look at the bottom line and think, I might want to do that. But really, if you take your olive agar and you breed it to your olive agar, you're likely to get all sorts of different colors. It's a really challenge at that point. So sticking with some of those simple crosses might be best at first. So that's just to give you a taste of eggs. Um, and um, I know it's just hopefully enough to, to whet your curiosity and you can look into it a little more. We can discuss it on the forum as well. So let's go on and talk about sex links on the next slide. Um, my second little piece of, of genetic information that are science information that I'm gonna leave with you is the use of a Punnett squared. If you remember these from high school biology or maybe you haven't seen them before, it's a way to sort of um, tease out what you're likely to get anytime you get a cross. So in birds, the sex chromosomes, as I mentioned before, are referred to as Z and W. The female has ZW chromosomes, the male has ZZ. So it's the female that determines the gender of the offspring. And any of the genes that are on those sex chromosomes um, are said to be sex linked. And this is how we create our sex links. This chart just shows you if you breed a male bird to a female bird, you get half male and half female, which we all kind of know intuitively. Though some years it seems like that doesn't quite work. I think this year was kind of a big cockerel year for some of us. Um, but, um, you know, in, in, in the overall scheme of things, we would get half males and half females. So let's look at the next slide. Um, when we're looking at the traits that we use for sex linkage in breeding birds, in breeding chickens um, in particular, the common traits that are used and are controlled by the sex chromosome are the barring gene and the silver gold ground color genes. Um, Barring, as you see here in the Bard Plymouth, one of my Bard Plymouth rocks, is actually a gene that removes color. So the Bard Plymouth rock is actually a blackbird. 
But then you add a barring gene, and what happens is the gene removes the color in little bands on the feathers. That's why there's sort of these like, you know, it goes white, black, white, black, white, black. And that's how the gene works. Um, and um, that color or that barring gene is seen in the chick as a white spot on the head. And that's how we can identify them at hatch. And we'll look at some of those in just a minute. So barring is dominant over non-barring. And then in the silver and gold, silver ground color in a bird is dominant over the gold ground color in a bird, which almost to me seems counterintuitive because it seems like there's more gold birds, but um, silver itself gives you a white ground color by inhibiting red pigment. It gets rid of the red pigment, even if it's there, coded to be there. And it's dominant over the gold, which gives you a gold ground color. So these birds that I'm showing you right here, the middle bird is a um, Rhode Island red um, cock bird and he's on a gold base, we call it. And then the female bird to his right is a light Sussex, and she is on a silver base. And then let's see what happens when we breed those two. We'll go to the next slide. What we get are red sex links. They present as those chicks, where the chicks on the right-hand side that are red are the female chicks, and the chicks on the left-hand side are the male chicks, and they're kind of silver or gold. And then the female, of this cross, and then she's again, Rhode Island red over a light Sussex is this nice brown color. And then the male red sex link um, is a very light color. He's got the silver base. Most red sex links males will also get these kind of red feathers coming through. And that's a different ground, that's a different color. It's actually not gold. It's called autosomal red. Um, and we call that leakage. So he's got red leakage on him, but he is a silver base color. Um, so it's a very easy cross at hatch to determine which ones are which. So let's go to the next. This is the Punnett square um, for doing a, sex, a red sex link cross. Remembering that silver is dominant over gold. And here's the key. Anytime we look at these, the female in a sex link cross, so the female bird, must be the one who carries the dominant trait. So it's gotta be the female who's either the silver bird or if we're using barring, she's the barred bird. So in this case, she's the silver, the male is the gold, he's the Rhode Island red. And we can see then if you follow the little squares, how it sorts out that the females do not get silver from their mother, but the males do. Cause they only get, they don't get, they only get the, the non-silver cr chromosome from their mother but the males get silver from the mother. So it always will be in the male that you see the expression of his mother in the colors, whether it's barring or whether it is the gold silver. I hope that makes sense. Might be something you need to go back and look at, but let's look at some other examples of how it works. So these are the red sex links that we do in our group. Uh, one of us in our group raises Delawares and one of us, myself, raise Welsimers. Um, and so if we use a Welsimer male, who is a gold base, over a Delaware female, who is a silver base, we get sex link chicks. Um, Delawares are interesting in that they are also a barred bird. Believe it or not, underneath that white is she's barred. She's kind of like a barred rock with white over, overlaid by a Colombian gene. Um, so she can also be used in a barred cross, but in this, or, you know, barring cross. But in this way, she's being used as a red sex link. And the chicks, those cute little guys down there, the females are the red ones. The males are the white ones. And the females, um, you'll see both of them kind of have a little bit of the chipmunky patterns that the, that the um, Welsimers are known for. But then let's see what they look like when they grow up on the next slide. Um, the resulting offspring that we get, we get silver males as they grow up and they actually start to look like the Delawares. They have that barring, but we couldn't see that when they were little because they were kind of silvery colored. And so you couldn't see a barring spot on their head, though they did have it. And then the female is a gold base. Um, the nice thing we're seeing with these crosses too, is that those, those males are now in a pastured um, meat situation being grown out. Um, they were, we're seeing that they're re reaching a very good processing age at 16 weeks. Um, giving about a four pound carcass at 16 weeks. 
um, and incredibly robust birds. Um, the females, um, we're just getting our first year of lay on these because we've only, but this was our first big year was this year. Um, and um, they're producing an egg that's, it's like a light Welsimer egg, but it's got some of the nice speckling, which is kind of nice that the Welsimers carry as well. And really nice temperaments on these birds. Um, they've been really popular. We gave them the name Cedar Bells. Um, I think it's a good idea if you do a sex link or if you do an egg cross of your own is to find some sort of a name that, that rings for people. It made all the difference in the world. Um, in fact, the very first ones that we sold of the of the cedar bells of these red sex links, um, we actually sold them to one of our local zoos um, because they wanted them for their animal behavior training shows that they were doing. And she was like adamant that we had to have a name for them. I can't call them red sex link. Kids won't understand that. So um, she prompted us to come up with a, with a name for them um, and have found that people really like that. Next slide. Um, so the other type of barring that we can, or I'm sorry, the other type of sex links that we can do is using the barring gene. Again, remembering that it's the mother, the female, that must be the one carrying the dominant trait, and barring is a dominant trait. It's dominant over non-barring. Um, so to create a black sex link, you take a female who is barred, who's got that dominant barring gene, you pair her with a male who is a solid color, and is going to help give you a dark chick down or dark enough chick down that you can see the head spot. So it can be a Rhode Island red, it can be a black Osterlorp. Um, you know, there's a lot of different breeds that you could, you could be in New Hampshire, it could be a lot of different birds. Um, the fact that the barred rock has a extended black helps give it a dark coloring. So you can use a lot of different male birds as long as they're not barred and you will get male chicks who are barred and female chicks who are not barred. So let's look at what those look like. Next slide. So here's our cross that we do, and that is using a parent bird of a black Osterlorp male and putting it over a barred rock female. We also have do the same thing, putting it over a Delaware female, because remember I said the Delawares are, sec are um, barred as well, though you can't really see the barring very well. And in this case, we get this ex these black chicks with the females having no spot on their head and the males having a spot on their head. And these little ones in the front there with kind of the brown foreheads, that's something that came from the, those are actually Delaware uh, Australorp cross chicks. Um, and I think that brown is because the Delawares also carry a Wheaton gene. That's my guess, but I don't know. It does kind of, did kind of help us identify them even easier um, and distinguish them from some of the other chicks too. So. Um, and then when they grow up, let's look at the next slide. The, off, the offspring are going to grow up to have a barred male and an unbarred female. This barred male, because it only has one barring gene, he has kind of what we call smutty barring. He doesn't, he's not really clean and crisp like the barred rock is. Doesn't really matter since he's probably being raised as a meat bird. Um, and then the female is going to be a black. And oftentimes the black sex links will have this red. Again, it's called red leakage. Um, and they'll have this red on their head and on their necks. Um, and so it's often one of the ways that you can tell a red sex link or black sex link if you see one is that black coloring with the red, um, red head. Next slide. This is a cross, a sex link cross that we do that's a little bit different. Um, this is one where I take a Welsimer male and I put it over a cream leg bar female. Now the cream leg bar is one of the breeds that I have. I have the th three breeds and they are actually a barred bird. You can't see the barring on the female very well because she also has what's called a cream colored gene that kind of mutes it out. But I know she's barred um, and you can often see little evidence, some evidence of barring on there but it does result in chicks that where the males do have the head spot, the females do not. Now you have to know your birds pretty well, your own line pretty well with this, this cross, though I find it actually is pretty simple. I don't know if you can see them very well, but like in the very lower left-hand corner, there's a little white spot on that guy's head. And then if you go directly up, you'll see a sister up there who does not have a white spot. So if you go through, we can find the white spots, pull them out. Those are our males. The nice thing about this cross is if we go to the next slide, it gives us, oops, okay. There'll be the slide after that where we see the cool stuff. But this is the offspring that result from it. So we get the barred male 
again, a single barring jean on a kind of a gold duck wing um, or duck wing pattern. And then the female who is an unbarred female and her eggs will look on this next slide for what we get with that. And that's where we get some really nice green eggs. So this shows you both the cream leg bar egg, which is blue, the Wellsimer egg, which is brown, and then the resulting offspring, the sex linked offspring um, that gives us these lovely green light olive eggs, um, some of them with speckles. Now you could do this cross the other way where the male was the cream leg bar and the female was the Wellsimer, but you would not get a sex link cross. So you just have chicks that you had to grow out to determine if they're males or females. So that works too, but it doesn't give you the, the extra advantage of having it be a sex link. So next slide. So this is one that we're trying. We haven't seen if this works yet. Um, this year we got some of Matt Hemmer's um, Smoky Blues, which are kind of an offshoot of his Urbanet recovery project. Um, he had some bluebirds that turned up, um, blue, black, and splash that turned up in that project. And they have a good rate of lay. They're a nice large bird. And so we thought, well, let's try making blue sex links by crossing them with our barred rocks. So that's what we're planning to do. Our projected results was that we'll have solid blue pullets and blue barred cockerels. Um, in the trade right now, this is a very popular bird called a sapphire gem. Um, it's actually not this exact cross, but it is the same color cross. They use an Andalusian, a splash Andalusian rooster over a barred rock hen. Um, and I think that first was made popular by the Czech, um, that dominant CZ group in, in Czechoslovakia that bred the, um, a bird called the dominant blue. And then it came into the American trade as a sapphire gem. And they're pretty hot right now. So we thought, well, let's see if we can provide one that's not only that nice blue color, but also has good rate of lay and has a nice carcass on the males. So we'll see what we get with that um, in this next year. Next slide. So I wanted to leave you with some um, ideas of breeds that would give would be good to choose for sex links. Um, remembering that the females have to carry the dominant gene. So you want females either from a silver ground color bird or a barred bird. Now it's easier to tell with the barred birds, but it's pretty easy to find information about um, whether whatever particular breed you're interested in has a silver or gold background color. It's a little bit harder to tell if they have gold because some black birds like Australorps are on a gold background. You'd never know it. Sometimes you get leakage on them, but um, you don't you don't really know if they have a gold background. So you can't always tell by looking at the bird. There may be other genes that obscure those, those ground colors. But if you look at this list, um, the gold males that are commonly used for the, for the red sex links would be Rhode Island Reds, New Hampshire's, Buff Orpington, Speckled Sussex. Um, I've seen Barnvelders. Um, Buckeyes make a lovely cross, particularly with either like a, black, a white rock or a a Delaware, they make a really nice um, meat cross um, for the males. And um, Wellsimers, of course, work as well. So we found that out. For silver females, <clears throat> um, the Delaware is a, is a good one. Light Sussex are traditionally used um, as well. Um, but any, a lot of these white or silver, pen, the silver penciled birds, whether the silver penciled rocks, silver penciled Wyandots, silver laced Wyandots, white rocks. Um, and then, you know, you can get out of your dual purpose breeds and into some more your egg breeds with your leghorn. So you could have a brown leghorn or a silver leghorn um, if you wanted to have a sex link leghorn. Um, and then barred females, the common barred breed that's used is the Plymouth Rock but also it would work for Dominique's, um, Hollands, and wouldn't it be lovely to see someone have a really nice productive flock of Hollands. Um, Cucamaran, which is what the photo is there. Um, <clears throat> Delawares can be used for a barred cross um, as long as you've got a dark um, background color on a chick uh, on the cross. Um, you can also use cream leg bars and Bielfelders, which are both autosexing breeds. And we're not going to talk about autosexing, but it's different than sex linked. Autosexing is a breed that actually can be told at hatch by its differing down color for male and female. And it's a trait that breeds true. Whereas with a sex link, 
it's only that first cross that works. So if I breed a red sex link to a red sex link, I'm not going to get red sex link chicks. I'm going to get, you know, they're not, it's not going to work after that second cross. So it's only that initial cross that will work for sex links. But with an auto sexing breed, um, it does, it, it works throughout the generations. But the reason you can use the Bielfelder or the cream leg bar is that they have barring. Um, on them. So it works. And then last slide. These are just some ideas of eggs, of uh, breeds for egg color. Um, particularly if you're looking to make the olive eggs that are very popular. So a dark brown egg layers, the most common birds, not a lot of them. Black copper morons are very popular, but not always the best layers. Um, which is one of the reasons they have those incredibly dark eggs is that they don't lay as many of them. Um, and at least in my experience, Welsimers, um, and then a, a kind of a Mediterranean breed called a Penedesenka, um, which lays a lovely dark egg as well. A rare, that's a rarer breed, but certainly would work for a good egg production cross. Blue egg layers, um, again, not a lot of breeds, but Americanas, um, and this is to distinguish them from the hatchery version of an Americana or Oracana, which are what we would call an Easter egger, more accurately. Um, the hatchery Easter eggers are not reliable to have two blue egg genes, so you could use them, but you would need to be you know, if you had a bird that was a blue egg layer that was a, a hatchery Easter egger, you could try it, you could use it, but you may not get um, quite the right results because it may not be homozygous for the blue egg gene. It may only have one blue egg gene, which in, in that case, half of its offspring would, would be green. So that might work for you. Um, cream leg bars are, um, I am particularly like these birds. They're amazing layers um, if you get the production lines. And their recent import, probably about 10 years now to the United States. Um, and if you're careful in where you select your birds, then they can be really a good layer. Um, but again, some of these smaller gene pools are a little more challenging to work with. And then whiting true blues are not a heritage breed, certainly, but they are a recently developed true breeding blue egg layer um, that is available, I think, through Murray McMurray or a hatchery, I believe. And then the only green egg layer that I know of um, that habit, you know, that breeds forward for green eggs is this Swedish breed called a silver red blue. Another recent import to the United States, rare, a, a little bit challenging to breed as there is a small gene pool, um, but they produce a lovely green egg. And there are crosses that people do with these. There's a cross called an ice cream bar. That's a cross of the silver red blue and the um, cream leg bar. And um, those are sold, sold through some of the kind of specialty groups like My Pet Chicken and, you know, kind of the designer chickens. But it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't turn away from the fact that they're actually a really nice layer, um, a very productive layer. So those are just some ideas for egg colors um, to consider. And um, I think we're ready to go to the very last slide for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa. That was spectacular. That was great. Um, lots of ideas. I just want to confirm, Lisa, that you will post some of your slides as resources back to the uh, Heritage Poultry Group on Apple. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I plan to do that in the next few days. I'll, I'll start a, a stream there for posting some of that and then also some other resources. Um, there's some good sort of basic um, poultry genetics information online that's pretty accessible. Um, and I think you can, one can learn a lot. There's a lot of information out there, but there's a few that's very, that are really good, I think. Yeah, and there's great. this, there's this wonderful, um, calculator, online calculator that's put together by a gentleman in the Netherlands, um, that I'll put a link for in which you just go in and plug in your breed and it will tell you what you'll get out of it. Um, or you plug in, you can plug in all these different things and it tells you how it inherits. So it's kind of a neat online calculator that folks can use. Really good positive feedback in the, in the comments and, uh, anything and else any, before we, I would, out just, of here? I would just say that, um, if anyone has any questions, I'm, they're happy to email me at our, 
um, website, which is peninsula or our, our email peninsula poultry breeders at gmail.com. Um, I'm happy to, to give feedback or provide information. So any questions, just shoot me an email. All right, folks, we're going to wrap it up there. That's a, that's our night. That's our October session. So come back in, for, I think November, I have to look at the dates in November to see where Thanksgiving falls, but, uh, watch your email. We'll get you back in here and, uh, Thanks for, for joining us. And thanks for Lisa for presenting tonight. Really great stuff. Thanks. And thank you, Mike. Great job.